Hello everyone, welcome to my four-part video series for my 30-pound featherweight combat robot crippling depression. In this video series, I'm going to do an overview of the robot and how I made the design decisions that I did. Then I'm going to go look at the electronics in part two. Part three will be all about the drive system and part four will be the weapon system. So strap in and let's see what crippling depression is all about. For part one of this video series, I want to just give you a broad overview of the robot in general. And the best place to start is the design. There's a lot of different types of designs for combat robots, and this one is an undercutter. An undercutter uses a weapon that is mounted uh, primarily kind of underneath up front. There's also horizontal spinners. Horizontal spinners would have the weapon mounted more like up here. So if I flip this up, you can actually see that the weapon primarily rides right down on the bottom and depending on the spacers that I use, this weapon can actually be anywhere from about, I think, 20 thousandth of an inch up to about 80 thousandth of an inch off of the floor surface. And you can barely tell, but right now it is just barely rubbing on this table because, well, it's just kind of a little bit loose right now after battle, and I'll go into that a little bit later. But this is an undercutter robot. And how I came up with this design was basically watching a ton of YouTube videos and also looking through the Riobots tutorial book, and they have a really great chapter in there about all the different types and kind of, you know, paper, rock, scissors, like what type of robot is effective against what other type of robots, so that you can kind of get an idea of which design you want to go for. There's a um, lot of trends in combat robots, and right now vertical spinners are really popular, wedges are always popular, drums are always really popular, and I wanted to do something a little bit different. I didn't want to do, yet again, another vertical spinner or, you know, another drum. I wanted to try something different, and there's not a lot of undercutters out there, at least in this design, in this weight class. So I actually made a spreadsheet and kind of put in, you know, all the things that were important to me and kind of ranked a few different designs and ultimately ended up with an undercutter based on, you know, the originality factor. I mean, it's not that original, but, you know, not a lot of people are doing them in this weight class, as I said. But the originality, um, the effectiveness against other robots, um, these tend to be very good against wedges or anything with unprotected wheels. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how I ended up with the undercutter design. Once I decided that my featherweight was going to be an undercutter, I had a couple decisions to make. And whenever you design a new robot, it's always kind of a chicken and the egg situation to where you don't really know what to design first. So what I typically do is start with a big spreadsheet and I kind of put down my known. Like I knew that I was going to have four wheels, so I said, okay, you know, here's the Bainbot wheels. Those are the ones I'm using. I also threw in the Colsons just kind of as a variable, and I knew how much those were going to weigh. And I said, okay, I'm going to probably use the Bainbot P60 gear boxes, so I threw those in, and I just kind of went component by component, you know, knowing that, okay, I'm probably going to use this, I'm probably going to use this, and it kind of gave me a good idea of where all my weight was going to be distributed. And I started with the drive because in so many competitions you see a robot that has a great weapon or has a great chassis or has, you know, something just really amazing about it, but then after one hit it just stops driving. And if you can't drive, it doesn't matter how amazing your weapon is. So what I wanted to do for this robot in particular is make sure that it always drove. I had a lot of issues with both Kamikaze and um, Sergeant Cuddles getting knocked out because they couldn't end up driving. So for this robot, I wanted to make sure that even through the apocalypse, this would still be able to get around. So I started with the drive system, and as you might have seen in the assembly video, the drive system is actually modular. It has these two drive pods that actually sit inside the frame, and they're just kind of, you know, loosely attached to the frame. And so those drive pods are kind of independent and pretty much bulletproof, and they're all just basically surrounded in UHMW, and there's really nothing that can break in there, you know, cross your fingers. So I started with the drive system, and what I did was I built a scale model or scale replica of what this would end up being, and basically used that as a test platform to actually test the drive pods around it and actually have some good footage of that. So check out the footage of the early prototype of crippling depression.
The majority of my focus in the design time for crippling depression was actually in the drive system. Not only the drive modules themselves and you know, the physical characteristics of those, but also the programming of the ESCs and getting the brushless drive system to work. This um, whole thing is all brushless. I used two brushless motors for the weapon and two brushless motors for the drive, and I had to reprogram those ESCs with Simon K firmware to get the forward and reverse control that is necessary for a drive. Drive was very, very important, as I already mentioned, for this robot, and I also wanted it to be invertible so that it could drive upside down as well. Doing all that took quite a bit of time, and I'll go into this in more detail in the drive portion of this series, but that's actually where a lot of my time was spent. But once I got that all prototyped and figured out, it was time to move on to designing the weapon system. As I mentioned previously in this video, Crippling Depression uses an undercutter as a weapon. So if we flip it up, you can see that this is the cutting blade here. It has a single tooth profile on it, so it spins around. Um, this is an off-center design. It is actually balanced. It might not look balanced, but it is actually balanced. The um, center of gravity here is offset to account for this tooth. And this whole Weapon disc weighs about seven pounds, maybe a little bit over seven pounds. It is half inch thick S7 tool steel that was water jet cut, and then it was hardened to Rockwell 54C, so it's actually pretty darn hard, and it is very flat, and it spins at a maximum RPM of around 6,000 RPM. And if I flip this thing around, you can see that it is powered by not one, but two weapon motors. These are NTM prop drive uh, 5050 motors, so they're 50 millimeters in diameter, 50 millimeters long, and there is a belt system on the underneath side. If you watch the assembly video, you can see a much better um, idea of how the belt system works, and I will, of course, go into the whole belt drive system in the weapon part of this series, but that is basically how it works. You get two 2,000 watt motors, moving this seven pound hunk of tool steel about 6,000 RPM. So it's not the biggest weapon in the world, but it still packs quite the punch. So now that we've talked about the overall design, the drive system, and the weapon system, let's talk a little bit about the materials and the frame. The majority of the frame is machined out of 6061 aluminum. If you follow my channel, you probably saw a previous video where I made this fixture plate, and I use this fixture plate to machine pretty much all of the components for crippling depression. There's basically two sets of hole patterns on here. One of those corresponds to the inner frame rails, the drive pod components, and the outside plates, and the other hole pattern corresponds to the front and the back plates. So with this one fixture plate, I can actually machine one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 of the unique components that are on here. So that's actually pretty cool, and it made building this chassis actually really easy. The whole frame is made up of 6061 aluminum, and I'll give you a better look at it right here. So we've got these two internal frames right here. This is basically the internal frame where everything attaches. I don't think anything doesn't attach to this. So these are kind of the most important piece, and these are 3 8 inch thick. Then we have the drive pods which attach on the outside of that, and then you have the actual left and right panels on the outside, and then the panels on the front and the back, and then you have the titanium armor pieces on the top and bottom. 
The structure is all 6061, as I said, 3 8 inch for this inner, and then the outside front and back are all 5 8 inch thick aluminum. And I chose 6061 primarily because of cost and just kind of, you know, durability. I would have gone with 2024, but it was significantly more expensive, and 7075 is just a lot more brittle. So because 6061 is just so readily available and so cheap, I think a piece like this is, you know, maybe 10 bucks or something like that on eBay. Bay. This is one of the um, side panels. It's just really easy to machine and really inexpensive to replace because I went through a couple iterations on this. So that's kind of the internal frame structure. I think I used number 8, 832 for pretty much all the armor plate connectors and 1032 on all the frame connections. As I've stated previously, the drive blocks here were all machined out of solid blocks of UHMW, and this front weapon block was machined out of a solid block of 6061. There's a couple um, little 3D printed pieces in here, mainly just to kind of keep wires out and just kind of um, you know keep things tidy on the inside, but they're just uh, 3D printed PLA, nothing special, and they did kind of break as you can hear, that's basically just rubbing against the plastic, and I'll go into that a little bit in the drive video, but they're really just there to keep kind of wires from getting caught up in the wrong places. The top and bottom, as I said, are titanium. These are 50 thou of an inch thick grade 5 titanium plates that have been water jet cut and lovingly spray painted. Um, black to stick with the crippling depression theme and these are really not for any kind of armor or defense They're not for any structural integrity or any kind of rigidity They're really there just to keep stuff from landing on the top and keep stuff from getting in and keep stuff from getting out So they don't really serve any purpose other than just kind of keeping everything kind of tidy and lastly, the thing that everyone always asks about is the coating. Once this whole frame was machined, I disassembled it and then brought it to Linex, um, which is a company that makes a truck bed liner, and they were actually willing to try spray painting or coating this lining on it. Linex is a polyurea coating, which is um, just a really fancy and really hard um, epoxy coating. It is sprayed at really high pressure and really high temperature and cures almost instantly. I think the guy said something like 15 seconds is what it takes to cure. Although over like two to three weeks, it cures even harder. And I only gave this stuff about a week. And so that's why you see some of the chipping and flaking. The other thing that I learned too is that if it's applied to really smooth surfaces, it doesn't really adhere as well. So let's say I'm going to redo this whole chassis from scratch, maybe. Um, I'm going to do it with a lot rougher surface finish. I might even use a rougher on all the outside surfaces to get a nice bite or a nice grip into it. I'm not really sure how um, you know, well this worked out. A lot of people have tried talking about doing this, but no one's ever really done it to my knowledge before. And I think it worked out okay. I really don't know what this chassis would have looked like without the Linex coating. Who knows, maybe it might have been much more beat up. Maybe it was better. It really doesn't add that much to the weight and it didn't really add anything to the cost for me. And if anything, there's a couple places where you can see that the weapons just kind of bounce off of it. Maybe if the Linex wasn't there, it actually would have impacted into the aluminum more. Who knows? But I do like having the texture here, and if anything, it does add another layer for something to kind of bounce off of or scrape against, and who knows? So um, we'll see. For the next iteration of Crippling Depression, I will keep the Linex um, just to see, and I want to get a better surface finish so it adheres better. So we'll see how that works out. So this concludes the overview for my 30 pound featherweight combat robot crippling depression. I ended up winning first place on the first showing, so I'm pretty happy about that. Next up, I will be moving on to Motorama in 2018, and we'll see how that all works out. Be sure to check out the next video in the series, which will go into all the lovely electronics, and then I'll move on to the drive, and then finally the weapon. As always, thanks for watching. If you want to check out more about my updates and other stuff, you can check out my Facebook page, or you can check out my Patreon page to not only support my channel, but also see the other channels that I support. Again, thanks for watching.